Frank Stillwell, a name synonymous with fear and terror in the annals of Wild West history. His indomitable will and cruelty earned him a notorious reputation as one of the most ruthless outlaws along the border. But who was the real Frank Stillwell? What drove him to become such a merciless killer? And how did he manage to evade justice for so long? Join us in this video as we explore the life and crimes of this infamous figure, peeling back the layers to reveal the dark heart of a man whose name will forever be linked to violence and terror. Frank C. Stillwell was born in Iowa in 1856 to parents William Henry Stillwell and Charlotte B. Sarah Winfrey. When he was young, his family relocated to the Kansas Territory, settling near Palmyra along the Santa Fe Trail. During his youth, Frank witnessed the widening conflict between the frontier settlers and Native Americans. At the age of seven in 1863, Frank experienced the divorce of his parents. William passed away, leaving behind Frank and his two brothers, Jack and Millard. Charlotte remarried and had two daughters, Elizabeth and Mary. This period was challenging for Frank as he grappled with the separation of his parents and adjusted to the new family dynamic. Frank's father, William, served as a private in Company B of the 18th Missouri Volunteer Infantry under the command of General William Tecumseh Sherman during the Civil War. He took part in Sherman's famous March to the Sea, a campaign that played a crucial role in ending the war. Frank's brother, Simpson Comanche Jack, still well, distinguished himself as an Indian fighter, scout, deputy marshal, police judge, and the United States commissioner. Like his brother, Frank had a strong commitment to justice and a tough stance on crime. In 1877, Frank and Simpson journeyed from Anadarko in the Indian Territory to Prescott in the Arizona Territory. Frank found employment at Miller's Ranch near Prescott where an unfortunate incident occurred on October 18, 1877, marking his first act of violence. During his time at Miller's Ranch, Frank had a heated argument with a newly hired chef, Jesus Vega. As their disagreement escalated, Frank's anger got the better of him, and he impulsively shot Vega in the lung, resulting in his death. The tragic event would prove to be a turning point in Frank's life, leading him down a path of criminal activities. Despite his violent act, Frank managed to secure an acquittal on the grounds of self-defense. Following the shooting, he left Miller's ranch and found employment as a, te as a teamster for C.H. Hamblin's Sandy Bob Line. After his time as a teamster, Frank relocated to Mojave County where he engaged in mining ventures. However, these projects would not be free from violence. On November 9, 1879, a dispute arose between Frank and Colonel John Van Houten over a mining claim. The confrontation took a tragic turn when Frank brutally beat Van Houten with a rock, resulting in the Colonel's death. Both Frank Stillwell and James Cassidy were charged with murder in connection with the incident. However, they managed to evade a grand jury indictment due to his insufficient evidence. This turn of events seemed to offer Frank temporary respite from the consequences of his actions. Unfortunately, Frank's troubles were far from over. His propensity for violence and involvement in criminal activities continued to haunt him. The tale of Frank Stilwell is one intertwined with lawlessness and bloodshed, making him a figure of notoriety in the Wild West. In the 1880 census, Frank claimed to be 24 years old, living in Charleston where he worked as a firefighter. However, it is uncertain whether his claim of being born in Texas is true, as Frank had a history of changing his identity and providing false information about himself. On September 8, 1881, a robbery took place on a Sandy Bob Line passenger train traveling from Tombstone to Bisbee, Arizona. Masked robbers targeted the passengers, stealing their valuables in a safe worth $2,500. During the robbery, one of the robbers mentioned the word road in reference to the stolen money. This led Virgil Earp and his team to pursue the robbers. While the robbers were apprehended, Fred Dodge, an, un an undercover agent for Wells Fargo and company, discovered a distinctive shoe print left by someone wearing custom repaired high-heeled shoes. The Earp team traced the shoe print to the repair shop in Bisbee, known for its wide leg boots. They were able to connect the, sh the shoe print to Frank Stillwell through fingerprints. This evidence implicated Frank Stillwell in the robbery, adding to his criminal record and raising suspicions about his involvement in unlawful activities. Upon his arrival in Bisbee with his partner Pete Spence, Frank Stillwell was arrested by Virgil Earp, Wyatt Earp, and Billy Breckenridge based on earlier gathered evidence. Judge Wells Spicer imposed a $7,000 settlement on Stillwell to be paid by C.H. Hamley. During the preliminary hearing, Stillwell and Spence presented witnesses supporting their alibi. 
The evidence of the use of the word sugar to describe money and unique shoe prints was deemed insufficient to convict Stilwell and Judd Spicer dropped the charges due to lack of evidence, similar to what happened with Doc Holliday earlier that year. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, many historians believe that Frank Stilwell was indeed involved in the Sandy Bob Line robbery. Meanwhile, tensions were high in the Wild West of Arizona, as the Earp brothers, Virgil and Wyatt, continued their relentless pursuit of the no notorious cowboy gang. Just two weeks after Frank Stilwell's acquittal, Virgil, as Deputy Marshal of the United States, filed new federal charges against Stilwell and his accomplice, Pete Spence, for interfering with a mail carrier. It was believed that Stilwell and Spence were responsible for a series of robberies, including the recent Sandy Bob Line robbery. Both were promptly taken to the territorial prison in Tucson to await trial. While Virgil Earp was in Tucson, his brother Wyatt took place as assistant city marshal in Tombstone. The Cowboys, seeing this as an opportunity, planned to strike back. On October 18th, Frank McClary, a friend of Stilwell and Spence and a member of the Cowboy gang, confronted Morgan Earp, another member of the Earp family, and warned him that they would kill anyone who tried to capture their friends again. The situation was tense, and inaccurate newspaper reports fueled the flames. The newspapers falsely claimed that Stilwell and Spence were arrested for a staged robbery near Contention City on October 8th, even though they were in custody in Tucson at the time. This led to the mistaken belief that the Earps were targeting innocent men and that Stilwell and Spence were falsely accused. The case was eventually dropped due to insufficient evidence, much to the disappointment of Earp and the citizens of Tombstone. However, the Cowboys should soon learn that breaking the law had consequences, as the stage was set for a showdown at the OK Coral. After the assassination of Morgan Earp, investigator Dr. H. M. Matthews launched a tense investigation. Marietta Duarte, the wife of outlaw Pete Spence, made a shocking confession. She revealed that her husband had returned home with Frank Stilwell, Indian Charlie, Frederick Bodie, and an unidentified accomplice just an hour after the shooting. Marietta also disclosed that her husband had threatened her with force if she revealed any information to the authorities. Witnesses confirmed seeing Frank Stilwell fleeing the crime scene. It's believed that Stilwell, Frederick Bodie, Indian Charlie, and others were involved in the assassination of Morgan Earp. After his brother's his death, Wyatt Earp took matters into his own hands, believing that justice couldn't be achieved through the broken legal system. Wyatt decided to avenge his brother's his killings by tracking down and killing the attackers himself. Aware that his brother Virgil was being targeted, Wyatt quickly assembled a team of deputies, including Doc Holliday, to protect Virgil. They boarded a train to Tucson, fully armed and ready for action. In Tucson, they encountered Frank Stilwell and other cowboys, creating a tense atmosphere. During dinner, gunshots rang out as armed men fled the scene. Wyatt claimed to have seen Stilwell and Ike Clanton, and he shot Stilwell while defending himself. Ike Clanton managed to escape justice and later testified that their troop to Tucson was to clear their names from federal charges. Following the death of Frank Stilwell, it was discovered that his true motive for the journey to Tucson was to seek revenge on Virgil Earp, whom he believed to play a role in his arrest. Witnesses confirmed seeing Stilwell and his gang armed and waiting for Virgil at the train station. Ike Clanton, who had accompanied Stilwell later testified that they were there to meet a witness for a grand jury testimony. However, upon realizing the presence of the Earp brothers, they knew trouble was brewing. The next day, Stilwell's lifeless body was discovered along the tracks, riddled with bullet holes. Eyewitnesses reported seeing Clanton and Stilwell together before the shooting. It has been speculated that Stilwell's poor shooting skills may have contributed to his untimely demise. The funeral held for Frank Stilwell the man accused of involvement in Morgan Earp's assassination was a solemn affair. His coffin was delivered to the grave without an escort present. Originally buried in the old city of Tucson Cemetery, Stilwell was later reinterred in a mass grave of Evergreen Cemetery when the cemetery was relocated. This marked a lonely and melancholic ending for a man who had lived a life immersed in violence and crime. The Earp brothers understood that they were now prime targets and had to remain ever vigilant in the treacherous Wild West. So this was the most heartless outlaw in the Wild West, Frank Stilwell. Don't forget to subscribe for more interesting videos like these.